I was asked a little while back, how does the Lexley actually tune its gravity flyer just by hearing it? And it took a little while for me to think through the process and go through exactly what I'm hearing in this thing when I'm testing it. And let me just show you this uh, in a very simple way. Let's start from the beginning on how you start this thing up to the end of what comes into it. So let's take a look at our gravity flyer here. So right here's our gravity flyer. Basically the first thing on startup we do is just turn on the motors. Pretty simple process, turn them on. What are we doing? We're looking for beats. What does that mean? Well, when you turn this thing on, if the high voltage part is too close, you'll hear scratching. You hear eh, eh, eh. That's not the beats. That's not what you want. You're going to start to hear some sound that goes boom, boom, boom. That's what you're looking for. Those are the beats right there. That is one of the only sounds that it's going to make in the very beginning before you add anything else to this. So, now that we know what we're looking for the beats, what do they actually look like? Well, let's take a look. we got a whiteboard here, and let's do some simple drawing on here. There you go. There's one. That's our frequency, right? So anytime you take a rotating disc, it makes a frequency. So, what are we going to do? This right here, sorry for the bad drawing, right in there is your beat. So basically, these two frequency waves do not have to be the exact same. As a matter of fact, they're not going to be. So, let's look at this. This is our gravity flyer here. We have our top disc, our bottom disc, and our middle disc. Now, what happens? This right here will get one frequency. This right here will get another frequency. Now, this one right here, I'm going to say 1000 RPM. This one right here, I'm going to say 600 RPM. Now you probably wouldn't think, okay, two different frequencies are not going to be able to work together. But that's not how beats work. With two frequencies that you can get close to each other, then you can get it to work. So, if we can lower this, and we can raise this a little bit, then we're going to get our frequency right in here, which is just right. So, what happens? In this right here, we are going to get our beat frequency right in the center plate. Again, point to point, beat, beat, boom, boom. That's what we're looking for. So when you see someone say that the motors are trailing together, it's not that they're at the same speed. They're just close enough to make a beat frequency together. That's it. You say, well, I don't understand. How do I get the motors to even go close to any, go faster, go slower, if they're just running. And it kind of goes to a, uh, a theory of a pendulum clock. If you hang a pendulum clock on a, rod, on a rod, and you hang another one right next to it, and they're out of sync, they're just doing whatever they want, eventually, they come together, and they'll swing. That's the same process we're looking for here. But you have an added advantage. Let's add in this a high voltage coil. So, now, we're just going to clean this up real quick. We take our gravity flyer here. And we're going to add in our high voltage coil right here. They're positive to the top. And are negative to the bottom. Now, with this high voltage coil, what do you get? You have a frequency here, okay? And you got a frequency here. Each one of them has a frequency. Now, we talked about this before, and it's worth going over right now again. What you want to do is lower the amps. The amps come out in white. The volts come out in purple. But what also happens when you do that? Well, let me show you this. This is a little circuit that I put into my high voltage right here. It's real simple. There's not many wires to it. All it does is add frequency to your high voltage. So, what did I find out? Every time that I raised the frequency too high, the voltage would stop sparking over. 
you get your spark gap you turn up your excuse me when you turn up your frequency too high it stops sparking over you'll still be there you touch both wires you're still getting shocked but what are you not getting you're not getting the spark over every time the frequency is too high keep that in mind this little circuit proves it so let's add this to it okay we're running this one and what happens as this thing starts going you'll have later on when we get to it I'm going to show it now just so you know it's there this ultrasound piece it'll take this and it'll take the RPM sorry and it'll drop it so what are we going to get it wasn't a thousand let's say that it drops it right around 800 okay probably more likely 925 or something like that I generally get when I run it about 910 915 somewhere in there it'll drop to that again understand both of my motors are connected to the same driver so everything works in unison on here I do not have any power powering through my drivers they are run on fan motors so they're very weak they're susceptible to the power differentiation between this disc and this disc in the high voltage that's one of the main keys that Alexi uses a lot of times we use too big of a motor and power right through it that's a mistake so I get this going right there it could be 910 like I said this one goes up from 600 to right around 700 okay maybe 710 715 I've got various readings on it somewhere right around there but what does that allow now if you change the RPM into Hertz it means that we're close enough to get a beat frequency as long as the timing of it lines up now the actual amplification doesn't have to line up but the timing does so we're gonna get our frequency here just like that now one frequency will be higher right here on the top one this one and one frequency will be lower right here however the timing still lines up our beats that's our beat frequency now that's the only thing we're going to be able to hear right now that's it there is no other sound coming from this so my personal opinion what is he looking for in the beginning he's looking for the beat frequency and that's it that's the only thing I found that you have consistently in this thing that makes a sound so what's the next process that he does he turns on his Tesla coil we got our high voltage on we already saw that when you turn it on you have to turn it on a little bit at a time first turn your dial up to three let it sit for a few minutes get it up to six let it sit for a few more minutes get it up to nine or ten and that's where your final stage is and that's where it sits it's building up voltage and layers and it probably has to do something with the beat frequency if you turn it up at the right times it may be something bigger I'm not a hundred percent on that but I have a very distinct feeling that that's what's going on here so let's take a look at her now we'll clean this back off now we're gonna look at our gravity flyer again right here we have our high voltage over here that was negative that's positive we're gonna add in our Tesla coil this is the next thing on our list just like this this is our Tesla coil right here now we put the wire down in the hole right here all the way down make sure it goes between this and this so you got your number one coil and your number two coil right here this is your number two coil this right here is your number one coil the wire goes all the way down so where does it go it goes directly to the frame they say well hold on hold on we we have a beat frequency here already you already have something in there now you're gonna put something else into it well this is kind of the key thing isn't it so what is a Tesla coil it's basically a magnetic oscillator so it takes two different frequency and oscillates them seems pretty simple you go well hold on you just said that we had two different frequencies in our center plate and they are creating a beat frequency now isn't that funny if we looked at it from the standpoint of just when things interact 
what are we going to get? So, let's look at it. Here we go. There we go. There's our beat frequency. It's already there. Our Tesla coil is now turned on and it's oscillating. What are we trying to do? This is probably the key and the answer to why he can do it by ear. If I set up my Tesla coil oscillation to match this, not in frequency, but in the relationship of where the beats are. I now am running two different sets, but I now need to align the power here to get this right here. Now I have two sets of frequencies. Now they come in at the same time. Not the correct frequency together, but the timing is correct. That's the only thing that they have in common. There will be two different frequencies, but it's the timing of it and how they fall in line is what you're looking for here. So now we have two sets. I now have a beat frequency. I am now matching that Tesla coil to my beat frequency. So what does that mean? The Tesla coil generally does not put off much of a sound. Here's the thing you've got to remember. Here's our high voltage right here. Here's our Tesla coil. What are they? In general, they are in magnetic electric energy. That's it. So what does that basically mean? Kind of like a speaker. It does almost the same effect. Now there's no cone on it. There's nothing like that. But you are getting what you get in the speaker. Speaker is generally just a magnet. We got a coil around that magnet and it's just oscillating or moving up and down. So that's it. So what does that mean for these two things here? Well, the high voltage is also doing that. So if I split this up and I split the core here and I put my core here, this is my DC high voltage core. Now I'm simply going to add a layer over top of it and I'm going to put another core of many wires on the outside. Well, that looks similar to that. That looks similar to that. That looks similar to that. We're all in the same process here. Again, we're running it on basically the same driver. We're using a very low 12 volt signal to drive it into either a MOSFET or a transistor. And what are we getting? We're getting a square wave DC that comes out onto our transformer core and it's basically putting pulses on it. And those pulses are transformed into this core part. And this core part uh, puts off a magnetic frequency. Simple as that. These two processes are so similar in design. There's not many things that are different. You say, hold on, hold on. This is AC and that's DC. Is it? Is it really? Because it's not. This is a mimic AC. Which means, every time you look at it, we are getting a pulsed DC signal. So, where else do I get a pulsed DC signal? Right here. The same exact signal runs both. That's what the thing is that you're not seeing. You're set up in your all your different definitions, but you didn't stop to look at exactly what the process is that we're using here. I'm not using a spark gap on this. This is a transistor. This is two MOSFETs or two transistors. Either way works. It's just a matter of how you set it up. We're looking at the same system here and we're not putting it together. So, get back to the sound part. What happens when you take two magnetic frequencies and put them too close together, you get feedback. Okay, let's continue where we were. My camera cut off. All right, so we were talking about, we had our two things. We had our Tesla coil right here, high voltage here. We talked about that. And we said that they were basically both like speakers. So what do we get when we take a microphone and we put it into a speaker and you get somebody up there and they don't know what they're doing we get feedback 
So let's look at our gravity flyer again. What are we looking for here now? We know that we got our initial speed and we have our beat frequency. Now we have from our Tesla coil connected in, we have our secondary oscillation. Now both are lining up at the same points. Not the same frequencies, but they're lining up at the same points. So High voltage goes here, here, negative here, and positive here. So now when we say what are we looking for in the sound next, it's feedback. How do you get the feedback? Again, microphone into the speaker. But how does that translate to our process here? The only thing that you're going to get when these line up is the amplification of either one. That's what you're looking for. When these things amplify, we're going to get a sound. It's not that hard to understand. They're both creating a speaker. Again, we said the speaker here was a magnet with wire. So when we put two things that have that into it, we get feedback. Isn't that something? We know we're getting the beat frequency. The Tesla coil itself is putting off an oscillation. If we can match the oscillation with the beat frequency, we can get feedback. The one thing that a microphone is set to do, what they get paid millions of dollars to make these things for, eliminate feedback and eliminate any background noises that don't need to be there. What are we looking for? The exact opposite of why they make those microphones. We want that feedback. We want it. That's what we're looking for here. It's the only thing you're going to be able to hear. That's it. Other than that, the Tesla coil really doesn't make sound. Not at the voltage we're running at. We're not running this thing at a huge amount of voltage here. Between 12 and 36 volts. That's it. And I don't even think it gets a 36. So usually I run mine right around the 20s. And then I maneuver it back and forth, back and forth, just a little bit to try to line these things up. The beat frequency was easy. Generally, most people hit that on accident. Matching a Tesla coil to a beat frequency is hard. That is not something everybody gets. That is something that takes some time and some tuning. The only way that you'll know that you got it is get the feedback in the Tesla coil. You cannot jump processes here. You have to follow exactly what Alexi said in the process what he said to do. He said, set this, tune this, to this. That means if this is given off a beat frequency, I now must tune my oscillation to my beat frequency. That's what he's saying. If you're listening for something, that's the only way to do it. You're not going to be able to do this any other way. This is what he keeps saying to do. We're trying to match too many different things and jump too many places. We're trying to add this part here, because we're obsessed with the piezo disc. However, that's the, one of the simpler processes in this if you can understand it. This is more one of the difficult ones to understand and get. Once you get this, let's move on to this. Now let me clean this board off and let's take a look at this. I'm going to show you a couple things that you probably don't know. Now I said earlier in our high voltage coil that it's actually doing something more. So let's let's draw this up again. Here's our gravity flyer. Here's our Tesla coil here. Here is our high voltage here. Then we got the positive here. We got the negative here. Now, ultrasound is here. This is the very next part in the process. What are we looking for here? This is going to put off a wave just like this we need this wave to line right here and right here now remember we're in dimensions here so when I say oscillation I say beat frequency they could be in this direction in this direction or something like this or whatever they want to do they don't have to be in the same direction 
but not everything lined up like you see it on your oscilloscope. It doesn't work that way. It's not the way things work. This right here is now another angle, so we're in 3D. So now we got this plate here. Now we're coming down on it right here. What do we need to do? This distance here and here is the most important factor in this. That's it. This has to line up here. What do you have to do? You have to adjust the voltage going in in order to change the distance between these here. You call it a frequency dial. But since it's the same thing, we're actually just changing the distance between the, these two lines right here so that it hits this and it hits this. If it doesn't hit both of those, we're done. Process game over. So it's going to be a great study when somebody decides to take this and show you a distance chart and find out the actual things in between. That's going to be a great help. Otherwise, we're shooting in the dark here. But once we get those, now we can align it with what we're looking for. Here, 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 and here, here. That's what we're looking for. That is our goal in this whole process. Not audible. Cannot hear it. One of the hardest things Alexi does is try to hit this on the right beat. Why can't he do it? Well, if you can't hear it, you won't know if it's positive or negative, or you can't get a feedback on understanding it. So you have no way to know it's working. The only way he knows it's working is if it jumps. And then if it doesn't, he hit the wrong thing. So what am I looking to hit here? In every frequency, there is a peak and there is a valley. I want in every one of them to come up with the peak and I want to shoot this ultrasound right through that peak. That is the sweet spot right there. It's like trying to hit a baseball with a side of the a side of a barn when you're blind. It's really hard. This is what we're looking for. That spike has to shoot right through there, shoot right above, however you want to say it, shoot above. And either way, it takes this right up. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the same thing at the peaks to go to the peak. That's basically it. That's what we're looking for in this. That's what he's doing. Those are the things he lines up. Now, interesting process that goes on when you turn on this. So let's take this out real quick. Let's look at this again. There we go. We know we're positive here. We're negative here. This right here. Built this circuit right here to put in here. This basically puts frequency into your high voltage coil. What happens with this? As I bring up the frequency, it will stop shooting the spark gap. Got a gap here, gap here, spark in the center, right? When I put the frequency too high, it stops shooting the spark gap. So it'll be here and here. It will not go into here. It cannot shoot the spark gap. So, I put my hands on it, yeah, probably stupidly, but I did. It's still working. It's still going to shock you. It'll shock the daylights out of you. Hopefully, you use the one hand rule and never touch anything with both hands, but it's still going to shock you. But what's going to happen? It's not going to transmit your charge here at all. So now you don't have this. What happens? The negative charge accumulates on here. It's stopping this from flowing. Therefore, the only thing that comes out is a negative charge. So do we see this in our process? Well, the answer is yes, we do. We see this lose all charge as soon as this starts going. This loses charge. This frequency is much higher than this frequency and drowns out the voltage from being able to accomplish its goal. This right here gains. That's why your speed increases on the bottom and this one loses speed. 
Again, we're using two fan motors. We are not using DC motors. The 12 volt fan motors themselves will actually change the speeds based on different charges on them because they're weak. That was the point. They flow easier to the right answer versus other motors that power through it. I keep telling everybody this, they don't understand it. You're extinguishing the frequency here. This gets all the charge. What do we not want? I used to think we wanted this, but I know now we don't. So right here's all our frequencies. We do not want interruption here. Too big of a magnet, too much interruption. It causes distortion. Distortion puts it into a phase distortion, which is very bad. We do not want a phase distortion. I believe, my personal opinion, the magnets are there to accumulate a same charge. Negative coming off here. Our magnets, also in negative, can accumulate a negative charge down here, never to touch right here. We do not want it touched in that center at all. Here's why. When Alexi talks about his anti-gravity effect, here is your frame. Now, the anti-gravity effect comes from everything that's here on your center, and it goes everywhere. I usually put it in as a bubble. Probably a mistake on my part. This is exactly what you're getting right here. You're creating a field around this. Here's the theory. If you take gravitational waves and they're coming down right here and they're applying a force upon any object by disrupting the gravity waves, you are now taking them away from the object. So now you have this thing here that's seen differently by gravitational waves. It can't place things upon it. It would be like taking something that vibrates and going out to the snow. When you set it there, the snow accumulates everywhere and just builds up and the pressure builds up upon it. But when something vibrates, it's constantly knocking off the snow. It cannot let anything accumulate on it. It's the same process here. Now, will it ever change weight? The answer is no. And I'll say it for this very reason. Take a baseball. I could throw it, you know, 10, 15 feet, no problem, right? Well, you're here on Earth, not a problem. I take that same baseball that weighs the same amount. I go to the moon. I throw it with the same amount of arm strength. What happens? Quadruple the distance, it keeps going. Why? Because it's not the weight of it. It's how it's perceived by everything else around it. The gravitational forces are different. Therefore, it applies different force upon the baseball. It doesn't change the weight of the baseball at all. And it never will. Baseball weighs what it weighs. I call it true weight. It's truly what that object actually weighs when there's absolutely zero gravity in it. That's what it is. Now, that's not a physics term or anything else, something I made up, something I like to think of it as, but that's okay. It just means the same thing. The baseball never changes in weight. It all changes on the gravitational forces. So if we're taking something in a super high vibration, which is a resonance, that way it can't accumulate anything onto it that actually makes it pull down, therefore negating gravity. And that's what Alexi's saying here. He's basically making something that uses the sound and everything into it and what he can hear in order to change the harmonics of it so that this right here, gravity wave, changes how it's perceived on the earth. That's it. So let's get back to the sound thing. We know the voltage changes between the two discs. We understand why now. We understand that process. Okay, what could happen from there? The actual positive, it could build up into a negative ball on the bottom. Then 
it could shoot back through the coil and put a huge positive one on top of it while removing all the negative. The earth itself has two fields that are equal in value. If we took this as our earth, this positive value and this negative value would have to equal at all times in order to be a magnetosphere. In order to change it for lift, you have to dissolve one field of the other. So, let's go back to the sound. What do we know we're hearing? We are hearing, very simply, the beat. We match that up with the oscillation. And we get the Tesla coil feedback. Those are the things we're listening for. Beats, oscillation, put them together, listen for the peaks. And we should hit our sound. This is what Alexi's listening to. There's nothing else to listen to. Nothing else really makes a sound. That's it. Unless you're talking about the screeching, which we didn't like, that's the only sounds that come from it. That's the only thing you can hear. And he tells you flat out there is a ringing in the Tesla coil, which should tell you our processes now match up. Our theories are now walking themselves together. It's pretty simple what he's doing. It's way simpler now that we actually know what they are. The hardest thing to do in this is take what we think or what we know or what physicists like to have this big array of knowledge for and cut all that out and go with what he's doing, what he's seeing, what he's hearing. And those are the only things he can hear. And that's what makes it crazy. You got a guy who takes the sound of this and he knows what he's looking for. And the rest of it just works out. Crazy? Yeah, maybe. But that's the way a lot of people do things when they tune them. They look for like things and they put them together and they work or they don't work. That's how tuning works. So, now we know what we're looking for. We know the sounds of it. That's the only ones we're going to get. We actually know the process of what he's doing for the anti-gravity. We know what he's looking for in the beat frequency. We know how we have to align this thing here. Now, knowing it doesn't mean we can do it. That's the hard thing about this. All the inconsistencies everywhere in it really don't matter. It's simply, to me, my opinion, lining up the beat frequency with lining up the Tesla coil to the actual beat frequency, and it won't look the same. This is, this is going to drive you nuts. If you take your beat frequency here, the Tesla coil may be rapid. Oh, isn't this a fun one? Now, you need to be able to align it. And I did a bad draw of a drawing, so I'll redraw it. right in here. You need to be able to align a faster frequency and a slower frequency, but they must line up at the same points. What does that also mean? Your ultrasound now has to find a point where they now line up. That's why it's hard. So, what do I think about it? Well, it makes sense why it takes them so long to hit the button and get it to do anything. It makes sense why it takes so long for the charges to move from one to the next now. And it proves why there is no charge or, or the ultrasound doesn't hit the bottom disc at all. Because the charge stays there. The negative stays there the whole time. Okay? The only way that it's gone is when the positive charge goes crazy and it gets filled up all the way onto the top. Anytime any 
negative or positive gets into the center disc, it ruins the whole experiment. I used to think you wanted it. I now know you don't need it at all. It actually ruins it. This is where the thinking is, guys. This is where I'm at. I'm going to now test the sound. This whole week, all I'm going to do is test the sound. That's it. I got to find out this answer. And if that's the way he keeps telling me to do it, forget the rest. Forget the fancy machines. Let's test the sound. Let's get this right. God, I hope it's that easy. Honestly, compared to what I've been having to do, this would be a piece of cake to do compared to playing all, with all those machines. Trust me, I like tuning things by sound. I can hear great sound, especially with my hearing aids on. I can hear a lot of sounds that most people don't. It would be much easier. So let's take the week and do it. What's, what's it worth to you to find the answer? To me, give it a week, we'll try it. That's where I'm going from here. Guys, I'm going to go ahead and read this to you, at least in part. And let's go ahead and take a look at what Alexi's saying. This is communication that he had with Charlie C. And let's go ahead and see what it says. Hi, Charlie. I saw your video. You were trying to tune the gravity flyer. Remove the neon lamp from the catcher, which is the Tesla coil. It distinguishes the power. And now on to tune the parameters of the levitation effect. The levitation of the apparatus is based on the interaction of the magnetic and electromagnetic fields. Six round permanent magnets interact with the electromagnetic field untwisted in different directions. This interaction begins to create torsion fields of the different directions. The middle disk to which the impulses are supplied from quantitative device does not allow for the fields to mutually neutralize. The ultrasound passes through these fields at a certain frequency creates a swing of the medium in which the gravitational waves of the earth do not have the time for interference in the earth and pushes it into the ground. You just need to create these conditions. One, correctly select the duty cycle of the pulse of the kicker. Tesla coil. Set the required voltage on the high voltage generator. Third, set the correct frequency of the ultrasonic generator. Fourth, combine all these adjustments into the parameters of all processes have to shift to other values. Now you can read the rest of this, just pause it and uh, look at the rest, but it falls right in line with what we're saying. Exactly what I said he was doing. We have to adjust one to the next. That's the way it works. Doesn't work any other way. Let's go on to another one here. Ultrasound starts from 200,000 Hertz and above. If you listen to the piezo element in complete silence, then your ear can hardly distinguish a barely perceptible rustle. I took a diagram from the internet. Here's the link. Okay, don't have that link. The device has built-in adjustment power supply unit from 1 to 30 volts, but the voltage must be set in the range of 9 volts. There's our first hint. I replaced the constant resistor with an ultrasonic circuit which variable one to adjust the ultrasound. Unfortunately, I do not have a frequency meter to measure the parameters. You must not only look at the frequency which resonates with the torsion vortexes created by the spinning disc, that's the upper and lower plate, but also adjust the duty cycle and the pulse from the catcher, which is the Tesla coil, and also adjust the voltage from the high voltage generator so there's no breakage between the voltage on the plates and the current is too low. Basically, he's saying it must be in a state where there's positive and bottom charges both present on the plates, on the spinning disc, at the same time. That is how you start this off. I myself have been dealing with this physical process created by the apparatus for half a year now. Alexi Kirchhoff. Hopefully I got his name right. Anyway guys, hopefully these communications help you in understanding this. Please pause them, read them, go over them. Maybe think something different than I do. But this is what I got out of them. And this is why I look back on the, what I actually am telling you guys on what's going on. 
All right, guys, I have one last one for you here, and I thought it was important to put this one in here. Please bear with my reading. I know I'm terrible at it, but I'm trying to help. Okay, here we go. Hi, Charlie. I'm sending you the instructions for the graviometer. Okay, the device does not need batteries. It works from electrical electromagnetic fields. The three antennas help to determine the field boundaries. The device has two indicators, red and green. Both... Below that is a potentiometer for an analog meter. High frequency energy emitted by the gravity flyer is captured by three antennas. The red indicator light indicates the presence of an electromagnetic field. The green indicator lights up when the upper and lower disc begun to a torsion vortex. So right now he's telling you there's a field outside the craft for the first light. The second light gives you the two torsion fields around the disc. That right there is important information and probably why we should build this circuit. They are not shielded by the antenna effect of the electrical device. The analog meter begins to go off scale in case you need to start to reduce the power of the electric field captured by the three antennas by tuning down the potentiometer. If the arrow of the device continues to go off scale, then you need to turn off the middle antenna and opening the switch on the right side. If in this case the gravity meter continues to go off scale, you need to move the gravity meter away from the device. This means that the torsion fields have formed an electrostatic cocoon around the device, which has a certain intensity of the shield of gravitational waves. Right there, he's telling you he's breaking gravity, and he just showed you on the device exactly what to look for when you do. Here we keep going. It is important to point out that the zone is very powerful torsion fields are harmful to the body, and they are. They put off a lot of uh, ozone in the air. It is necessary to limit the time in the experiment the antennas placed on the field of the gravity flyer will show the intense zone around the apparatus which is not descri describable to cross desirable that's what i think it says the indicator should be adjusted when all three antennas are tuned and the analog device is positioned in the maximum sensitivity. As the electromagnetic field increases, the sensitivity should be uh, reduced. Two lit indicators signal that the device is tuned to the levitation effect, in which the gravitational waves bend around the body of the gravity flyer. Again, exactly what I told you guys a little earlier in this video. Please, again, I implore you to read all of these for yourself. Decide how you want to look at them yourself. Please read them better than I did. But please understand them. From what I took from it is what I showed you today. He's looking for sound. We know that. But he also has a device here which he's actually pulling the parameters out of. If we follow his directions, we should probably get this right finally. Stop putting things in here that don't belong, is basically what he's saying. So, let's do it his way. We got the week. Let's make it count. Anyway, if you like what you saw today, please like, share, subscribe, do all those fun things. Have yourself a great day.